Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. In business, say focus on money in, not money out. And that doesn't mean, as you said, Jim, that you don't focus on productivity and on cost, but you cannot save your way to prosperity. You know, I used to like to say you can make a pizza so cheap nobody wants to eat it. You know, but the only way you're really successful is to sit back and think about how do I optimize the revenue of the company? The growth flywheel is such a positive flywheel. If you're growing, you know, you have more opportunities for your people. If you have more opportunities for your people, their satisfaction's higher. If their satisfaction's higher, your customer satisfaction's higher. We're really always pretty intently focused on growth. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Vertical Space. What a special guest we have today. You'll really enjoy our talk with Greg Brenneman. Getting insight from a leader in aviation, business, and investment gives us a great and broad perspective as we innovate at the intersection of tech and flight. Some of you may know Greg as an extraordinary airline and turnaround leader, some as a CEO or board member of a number of large companies, including Burger King and Home Depot, and some know Greg as an executive chairman of CCMP Capital Advisors, a leading private equity firm, and some may know Greg from his many talks including his TED Talk. Now, I have to tell you, my first connection to Greg was when he was president of Continental Airlines during their extraordinary turnaround years. I never met Greg, but I heard a lot about Greg. What I remember from my personal interaction with the operations teams to the senior executives is that they all referred to and were driven from an easily understood and clear plan. All of the employees, they all seemed to understand the plan and they together pulled in the same direction. It's still a vivid memory of mine. And now to hear from Greg and how they established and executed the plan, this alone was rewarding for me. The success of Continental is well known. Today, you'll hear some of the magic ingredients that made this turnaround happen, along with many other turnarounds that Greg has led. In fact, listen to how Greg defines the two types of turnaround. One, I think will really surprise you. Now, about a year ago, I read Greg's book called Right Away and All at Once. I've given the book and I've recommended it, the book to a number of high school and college graduates, as well as to those who want to know how a great business person and person operates and leads their company as well as their life. You'll hear about parts of the book in our talk. So what else do we talk about? Greg shares his perspective on the aviation industry today and how it has evolved in the last several years and the extra level of discipline that COVID brought to the airline industry. He outlines what he thinks airline CEOs should be thinking about and what area he thinks needs extra attention today. We discuss how technology has evolved over the years and listen to the opportunity Greg believes could be addressed by today's technology companies. Listen to his response to Luca's question on what threats airline CEOs should be thinking about and obviously his perspectives on advanced air mobility, how he would view AM if running an airline today and the many near and long-term opportunities for advanced mobility. And for advanced air mobility companies who intend to be both OEMs and operators, what to be aware of and pay extra attention to. Just listen to what he looks for in companies he's about to invest in and the leadership of those companies. And also the first steps Greg takes when running a company or turning it around a company and the lessons from his one sheet of paper. One constant theme is Greg's continuous focus on frontline employees. As he says in the podcast, what can we do better to treat our people well? Because in a service business, Whether it's an airline or whether it's Home Depot, you're only as good as your frontline associates. You have to listen to the advice he would give and gives in his book to the innovator and to the business leader. And lastly, listen to Greg's advice on what he has found to be special ingredients to leading a successful and happy life. Thanks again for a special talk, Greg. And to our listeners, we hope you enjoy our talk with Greg Brenneman as you innovate in the vertical space. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access or beyond vision line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace.
Greg Brenneman is executive chairman of CCMP and a member of the firm's investment committee. Greg plays an active leadership role in executing the firm's overall strategy while remaining actively engaged in completing transactions, developing strategies, and coaching the senior management of CCMP's portfolio companies. Prior to joining CCMP in October of 2008, Greg served as chairman, CEO, president, and or COO of Quiznos Sub, Burger King, PwC Consulting, and Continental Airline. In 1994, Greg founded Turnworks, his personal investment firm that focuses on corporate turnarounds. Prior to founding Turnworks, Greg was a vice president for Bain & Company. Greg currently serves on the board of directors of Hayward, BGIS, Baker Hughes, Baylor College of Medicine, and The Home Depot. Greg is an Emmy Award winner and the author of Right Away and All at Once, Five Steps to Transform Your Business and Enrich Your Life. Greg holds a BBA in Accounting and Finance, summa cum laude, from Washburn University of Topeka, Kansas, and an MBA with distinction from Harvard Business School. He is awarded an Honorary Doctor of Commerce degree from Washburn University. Greg Brenneman, what a great pleasure and honor to have you on our podcast. And let me introduce you, please, to Luka Tomjanovich. Uh, Jim and Luka, a pleasure to be here with you both today. Thank you, Greg. Welcome. Greg, is there anything that very few in the industry, and you can pick the industry, agree with you on? Yeah, it's a it's a it's an interesting question, Jim. You know, I, as I think about the uh, the airline industry, I haven't been in the industry per se, running an airline for uh, for quite a while. So, uh, in terms of others disagreeing with me, I, I would just tell you the top debate I've had with those that are in the industry is the debate about how much leisure travel and business travel will there be going forward. Uh, you know, said another way. Mm-hmm how much business travel will come back. As many companies kind of got used to the savings that came from uh, you know, restricting their travel during COVID, clearly travel is, at, is reaching all-time peaks again, but with much more of a leisure mix. And I, I'm not sure that there's not 25 or 30% of the business travel that we won't see again, just because companies have engineered around it. But that's been more than made up for with the leisure, the people that want to travel on leisure and even people that are willing to pay for uh, first class or business class travel on leisure. So that's probably the number one debate that's been going on out there is just those uh, airlines that relied so heavily on business travel going forward, how much of that will make it back. But I'd also tell you, since the time I've been in the industry, things have changed uh, some dramatically for the better. And then there's some kind of back to the basics people need to focus on. The technology has advanced dramatically. We introduced e-ticketing when I was at at Continental and it really took off. And in about three years, it went from literally 100% paper tickets to 100% electronic tickets. And that seems like a an era gone by. But if you look at what's available out there now, technologically, I was just in Greece and then Back a couple of days, uh, that was vacation, and then in business in Australia, New Zealand for a couple of weeks, and and uh, so I transited a bunch of different airlines and a bunch of different airports. And what you can do with technology across the industry for ticketing, purchasing, seat selection, airline changes, check-in, security clearance, like flight warning and tracking. You know, basically, you can do about anything you want electronically, uh, which I found to be incredibly helpful. I wish the airlines could figure out how to consolidate it all on one app because uh, I think I have like six different airline apps on my phone now to, to track all that stuff. But it's really great. And the, the other thing that's changed in the industry pretty dramatically is uh, much better dynamics in the industry. The consolidation actually allowed the airlines... I think to have a more stable industry with a little bit better pricing power and maybe a little bit less ego-driven management than was around when I was uh, Mm -hmm. when I was in the industry. But uh, some of the main issues like labor costs and fuel costs uh, remain. So uh, still the same industry, Mm -hmm. but you don't see the bankruptcies like you used to uh, in the airline business. It's it's kind of fundamentally better in terms of a little bit what people I think could focus on a little bit more. You know, we always said in order to be successful, we needed to get people to their destination on time with their underwear, serve them good food when they're hungry and show them movies when they're bored. And in order to do that, you need to have the airline, uh, the hard men and women that work at an airline, the pilots, the flight attendants, the mechanics, the gate agents, all on the same page with you Mm -hmm. and all delivering excellent customer service. And I think in this time, particularly coming out of COVID and with some of the angst that's out there in the world, really doubling down on the on the people factor in the airlines is something that could make the industry a lot better. But I'm not sure I'd get a lot of disagreement on that, at least among the flying public. Maybe I would among the airline executives. 
funny when Luca and I were preparing for the podcast and he said, you know, Jim, tell me a little bit more about Greg. And I said, what I can tell you is what Continental was like when you were running the airline. I remember whether it be the baggage handler, the, the manager of operations of an airport or the executives, they were all on the same page and there was a clarity to what they were doing. And so it was one of the first times I was telling Luca that it, you had a sense that business people were running the airline. And let me ask you, so what advice would you give to a person running an airline today for, as a business person? You came from Bain when you went to Continental. What advice would you give to them if they called you up and said, I'm about to take over a major airline? You know, what would be the, now we could, we're gonna get into your book, we're gonna get into your five steps to transform you to business. Yeah. And you can answer it accordingly. But what advice would you give to uh, she or he? Yeah, no, I, I think if you can sit back and actually, I always just pulled out a one sheet of paper and across the top, I'd write four quadrants, basically, break it into four quadrants and write market, financial, product, and people. And then I'd sit back and I would say in the airline, under each of those categories, under market, under financial, under product, and under people, what are we doing that is actually brain dead? basically. You know, what could be as a customer sitting there, what could we do better? And what could we do better to be more efficient? What could we do better to deliver a better product? What could we do better to treat our people well? Because in a service business, whether it's an airline or whether it's Home Depot, where I'm lead director, you're only as good as your frontline associates. If you treat them poorly and you handle them poorly, the customer's going to get service that's not very good. And so I think just taking out that one piece of paper, if I was starting from scratch and saying, you know, what would I do, you know, in each of those to make it better? At Continental, we turned that one page into what we called the go forward plan. And our market plan was fly to win. Our financial plan, fund the future. Our uh, product plan was make reliability a reality. And our people plan was working together. And then under each of those four, we had four or five key things that we knew we, if we did, the airline would be successful. I think it was for Blaise Pascal in the 1400s that first said, I would have written you a short letter, but I didn't have enough time. So I wrote a long one. Right, right. The hardest thing to do is take time to write the short letter. And that's what I do if I was starting out. You've also said that if you can't write a, for example, a turnaround on one page, you shouldn't be doing the turnaround. That was always my acid test because after Continental, I got asked to take on many different kind of CEO roles to turn companies. And then, you know, more recently, you know, as an investor, just buying companies and, and investing in them. And I, I've actually got a rule that if I can't take out a sheet of paper and in those four market financial product and people and kind of with a pretty good sense of what needs to be done right down specifically why I should own it or why I should run it, that it's probably a great job for somebody else, but, but it's probably not <laughs> a good job for me because I can't bring that much value to it. So I found that to be a great acid test. Focusing on the product side of this squad chart, were there any new business models that you were thinking about, considering, discussing at Continental, but at the time you were constrained by technology, which today perhaps could be possible. Yeah, no, I, I would say the, the answer to that is you really, some of the technology that's happened since then, Luca, it's a great question. You don't even know that it's going to be available in the future. So you're trying to read the future a little bit. We were fortunate because before we came to Continental, Bob Crandall had invented the frequent flyer program. So in a way that was, a, you know, it seems a long time ago and it was, that was a form of technology. So we adopt, you know, we had that technology in house and we'd used it, but we started asking questions around electronic ticketing and things like that. We were spending at the time about 20% of our cost in the distribution system, you know, all the way from, you know, somebody calling a travel agent for a ticket to them printing this paper ticket, you know, and you, some of us are old enough to remember all the carbon copies of paper that would get all over our hands and those paper tickets and then, you know, using them. And then you'd have to have people on the back end, hundreds of people, thousands of people that would do nothing but reconcile those. So you'd reconcile your revenue. And it was a real jump in technology to actually be able to do that all electronically and to board somebody electronically. And now we take that all for granted, but that was kind of all the technology we came up with during the time. The technology I see now in just being able to electronically manage the entire travel experience from beginning to end in the airline, you know, is phenomenal. And I honestly can't wait to see what comes in the future in terms of how technology 
can continue to transform the business. But it allowed us to actually take our distribution costs, just that simple e-ticket example, from about 20% of revenue down to 4% of revenue. So that's how much more efficient it, it's made us. I don't know the calculation. You could probably ask somebody uh, from the airlines on the next podcast, how much cost they've actually been able to pull out and how much more efficient they've been able to get by having, uh, you know, check-in be electronic, have no paper tickets at all, just using your uh, the barcode on your phone to actually go through security and board. And that clear mm -hmm. has brought a lot of advantage. Uh, you know, we're just scanning your eyeballs and then you're basically, you know, through security very quickly. So I think technology has been a real game changer. It doesn't, though, substitute for the fact that you you need the, the the men and women that are working at the airline to really be treated fairly, be handled fairly, and uh, to provide great customer service. Because there's as much technology as you put in, there's still that human element, both at the airport and on the flight, that makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Are there any technologies that you would single out as some of the most promising ones or the ones that you're looking forward to the most, perhaps? Sure. I don't know, platforms or tools for maintenance and supply chain management, for instance, leveraging blockchain for parts tracking or software and data to bring operational efficiencies or things on the distribution side. Yeah, those are, Luca, those are great examples on certainly the maintenance side and the supply chain side. And I think to some degree or another, all of those are being used and will get refined and get better and, and better. One product that's kind of intrigued me to think about, it's a, if you think about flying, when that when a, a airline takes off and a seat is empty, whether that be a first class seat, business class seat, or a coach seat, it's like a play, you know, on uh, Broadway. It, it expires essentially. You can't use it for anything else. So there are some people working on some technology and experience experimenting with some technology to do things like live auctions of uh, upgrades at the airport. So if you think about an international flight, if business class is only 80% full, you basically have the people that are flying mm -hmm. coach that can actually get on a platform at the airport and actually, uh, you know, with a good experience, do a live auction for that business class seat, which is all incremental revenue to the airline. So I think they're still around the kind of distribution and customer experience there's probably still some experimenting to do with how do you, you know, how do you both give a better customer experience at the same time you optimize revenue? You know, in terms of the aviation value chain, I think it's really, really interesting to see what people are doing on the front end of the customer experience with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with technology, whether it be the auction idea or, you know, Luca, your idea for, you know, how to sell seats, whether it be how do you really kind of improve the customer experience by automating it even more? I, I find all that to be super interesting. And I, I actually think that in freight, it, the last mile is always the trick, right? It's how do you solve the last mile? I think with all the drone technology, the vertical aviation technology, how do we solve that last mile between maybe the airport and uh, and home or home and mm. another location that's not 30 minutes away, right? You know, how do we, how do we over time, you know, when I was growing up, there was a TV show called the Jetsons, right? I don't know if you guys ever watched that. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I was unfortunately, thought, I did, yes. <laughs> I always thought it was so cool. They could jump in their spaceship and, you know, go to the grocery store. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're talking about here. But right. I, what about when you look at the avionics providers, the airframers, and then and further downstream in service operations. Do you think that the profits distribution in today's aviation value chain is going to be similar to the one 10 years from now, 15 years from now? That's a great question, Luca. It's never been fair in my estimation because everybody but the airlines always made money. You know, all the suppliers, all the maintenance guys did, all the suppliers did, the aircraft manufacturers did. And then you look at the PL of the airline and you'd say, gosh, all the hard work's at the airline. What are we doing here? I mean, mm -hmm. these guys are all doing well. But I think that's started to get redistributed just a little bit. Obviously, on the airframe provider side, you've, you know, the aircraft manufacturer side, you got Boeing and Air. Airbus and and uh, you got Embraer Air and so and and Bombardier and a few others out there and more closer to GA but but the, they they really do have a pretty good little duopoly going and they've had their struggles lately but they're you know they're doing fine I think the avionics providers and the engine providers have been kind of consolidating too gosh they have huge supply chain issues now so 
there's just such a constraint on airplanes, whether it's supply chain or, or aircraft manufacturers, uh, it's incredible. So I think that, you know, at least in, in big aviation, you know, what we think of today as the commercial uh, airlines, that'll stay roughly the same. I think it's been consolidated as much as it probably can be. This disruptive technology stuff that Luca, you and Jim are working on would be the opportunity, I think, for a breakout in some uh, some way, because I think it'll be tough to break into, you know, that the aircraft manufacturing business or the avionics business. Speaking of Boeing, recently it was announced they're going to put off building a new aircraft any thoughts on that? I'm not surprised by that, Jim. You know, when Airbus had come to me, it's a long time ago now, when they were thinking about the A380 and they were going to everybody. So it wasn't just me, but they were asking, you know, what do you think about this airplane? How does it look to you? And I said, you're going to spend a lot of money. You're going to lose a lot of money. It's not going to be successful because what people want is frequency and, you know, packing more people into an aluminum tube, except in very, very descript markets, is just not going to kind of be successful. And so I think what Boeing did, for example, and they've had their issues, but with the 787, where they made it lighter weight, more fuel efficient, but essentially it doesn't look a lot different than say what a 67 looked like, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, it's nicer inside. They got different lighting and all that, but you know, it's just basically a more efficient, you know, version of that. Once you have these platforms out there, I think incremental improvement on them is going to be much more economical than an entirely new platform. It's very, very expensive to develop a new platform. I think with the with the Max and you know, you'll see lighter weight materials and and things like that get introduced. I think over time, but uh, but I'm not surprised that they'd elect to stay with the platform they have because I think they basically have the the right platform seat wise to to handle mm-hmm. the markets they want to handle. So, Greg, you've talked a little bit about technology and aviation, and we have an awful lot of entrepreneurs on the, on the line right now, some who have a, an idea and some who are growing their businesses. Just to, from a general tech perspective, what advice would you give to someone with technology and they want to bring it to an airline? What are some rules you would have them follow? Yeah, I think, I think Jim, it's a great question. I, I think I would make sure my idea was a really good one by testing it with folks that like yourself and uh, like Luca that are around and in uh, the airline business, understand uh, some of the constraints that the airlines are dealing with and can pressure test it you know, online, I was recently looking at an opportunity, a little uh, piece of technology in the airline business. So I actually uh, called Jeff Boyd, who's the former chairman and CEO of uh, Bookings. And Jeff and I actually got on the phone with the entrepreneur and, you know, kind of threw darts at, you know, what about this? What Mm -hmm. about that for a while? And uh, that was a great way to test, you know, to test it out. But there's a lot of folks that have been in and around the airline business over time that would be, I'm sure, more than willing to sit down and take a look at the idea and uh, help just point out where the dr- where the friction is going to be as you try and think about operationalizing it inside of an airline. What's the state of the industry today and, and who do you like and what uh, airlines do you think are making a difference? Yeah, I, I actually think the airline industry is is as healthy today as it's ever been. You know, in my uh, in my career, part of that's the consolidation we talked about earlier, and mm-hmm. and they've consolidated uh, nicely. Part of it is that, that the technology has gotten really good, and it's kind of leveled the playing field on customer service to some degree in terms of at least the front end piece, the technology piece, of customer service. And then COVID, in a strange way, has really helped the industry because the industry was forced, you know, it pretty much had to shut down or dramatically downsize for a while. And it's not that easy to bring things back up. And travel demand took off so fast that now the industry has to, the airlines have to sit back and say, I have to be pretty selective about routes I fly Mm. to make sure that I have the equipment to fly the route and I have the people there to, to actually execute on it. And it's added just an extra level of discipline, I think, in the industry that's that's really made uh, made a difference. And I guess the only thing I'd say on the flip side to that is I just really do believe people need to pay more attention to the men and women that actually do the work every day. You cannot do those jobs, pilot, flight attendant, mechanic, uh, gate agent, baggage handler virtually. And so uh, uh, they're hard jobs and and. <laughs> The, your customers only get as get as good a service as the as a, your associate that's uh, in those jobs is, uh, and, and they're only going to feel good if you treat them well. And so, 
I think that's probably the area if I was an airline, I'd uh, double down on it. As I talk to pilots and flight attendants as I fly and gate agents as well, that's probably the number one, uh, the number one area mm-hmm. where I see there's a gap at the moment. And I think well, that gap spans most of the airlines. Some are better than others at it, but I think there's an opportunity there for almost everyone. Greg, what's top of mind for airline executives today? What existential threats are they most concerned about? Luca, that's a that's a great question, and and they'd be better to answer than me. But uh, you're talking about a group of executives that have just gone through COVID, so there's been some seminal events, right, over time in the industry. Certainly, 9/11 was one of those seminal events where air traffic just shut down for a while and it took a while to come back, but it was relatively short lived, right? The same thing happened you know, around in a different way around the financial crisis where uh, the Great Recession, I guess we call it, 08, 09, where, you know, folks had to survive that and get through that. I don't think any of us in a million years could have imagined COVID shutting down, a, you know, a, a virus shutting down uh, the world and the industry like it did, you know, right. just, just a year or two ago. So I think the threats that you kind of worry about are the kinds of things you can't see around the corner and you have no way of really anticipating, or maybe we could have all anticipated COVID, but it's hard to imagine how that would have worked. So I, I think that's what always keep kept me up at night, you know, as I was running an airline. And I think that's probably what keeps uh, the executives up at night today is uh, we can actually deal with what we know, but what is it we don't know? <laughs> you know, what is it that's out there that we, uh, you know, we we don't know? You've talked about focusing on the right routes as, as an important area right now. But in some degrees, does that open up opportunities where there are now an awful lot of routes they're not being focused on? You know, one of the things we talk about, what are the purpose of the podcast? And we talk about the intersection of tech and flight. Are there opportunities now for other modes of transportation, uh, advanced air mobility and the like at, in those routes? Or is, or is there a reason the airlines are pulling out and are, are there not opportunities? No, I, I would guess it's a great question, Jim. I would guess there are opportunities in those routes. The airlines will get spooled up reasonably quickly. So uh, that, I mean, by that, I mean, over the next year or two, you know, as they constrain on planes and, and people uh, relieve themselves. And so I think you got to ask yourself what technology is out there that's readily available now to fill some of those gaps, right? And what is, you know, five, 10, 15 years into the future? Because uh, probably at least for the moment, some of those gaps will start to get start to get plugged. But I think the opportunity is clearly there right now. People are willing to pay quite a bit to travel. And the airlines have actually focused on the routes, you know, where they make the most money. And so that's opened up, as you as you've said, some other uh, opportunities. One opportunity that that's opened up immediately, you know, so a quick reaction to it, but it's not really new technology is the whole general aviation market. So I own an airplane and when I'm not using it to select in select instances, I'll charter it. And the charter demand is through the roof and you can almost charge whatever you want for, you know, to charter a a private airplane uh, to somebody. And uh, it's incredible to see how much that market has actually exploded. So that's been part of the answer, uh, Jim, to that question, I think, is uh, just people are saying, I can't get where I want to go as timely a fashion. So I'm just going to charter a plane and go there. I want to ask you a little bit about advanced air mobility, You you know, drones, electric planes, vertical takeoff. And when I mentioned this, what's your first reaction to this area? My first reaction is how soon can we get it, right? I mean, how soon can it become truly operational? And can it become truly operational for passenger travel in a way that doesn't require as much training or licensing, you know, that uh, is a little bit more automatic? I I love the idea of, especially for what I call shorter haul, you know, travel, having the ability to get in an electric airplane and uh, have it be very automated and be able to go. I'm not sure, and you guys will be closer to this, just how soon and how practical that that is. There's a, a lot of FAA issues and airspace issues to work ar- around, but maybe more than that is just when will the technology be truly available? I've seen some, and I know the airlines are betting on some that's uh, And I know Walmart, I was talking to Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, they're betting on some drone technology, certainly for delivery and things like that. But but when will that be, uh, you know, available and practical? Well, Greg, you're the lead and director, you said, at Home Depot. What's your perception of drones, for example, even with Home Depot? I mean, how does Home Depot or its peers think about drone delivery? Are they looking at Walmart's 
very ambitious plans to roll out drone delivery, thinking about, you know, hey, what's our strategy as it relates to this capability? I'd say, you know, probably the first folks with really good thoughts and, and the, the, the front line or call, call it the leading edge or maybe even the bleeding edge of thinking through the drone technology is uh, I think folks like Walmart are people that are delivering packages that don't typically weigh a lot. You know, because mm -hmm. weight is a big, anytime you put anything in the air, weight is a, is a constraining factor. And so if you're delivering groceries or you're taking somebody a hamburger or some ice cream, that actually uh, is kind of mostly what's being experimented with, at least what mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, if I'm talking to folks like the Walmart folks and others that are out there doing that. At Home Depot, we really are watching it closely, but we haven't done any true experiments with it. And part of the problem is it's pretty hard to put a two by four on a drone. <laughs> right, and, right. and most of the stuff we sell are a lot of it, a bag of fertilizer, you know, I mean, there are, we have some smaller items, but even a can of paint, right, weighs a lot. And so you, it probably is the right thing to be broken in by the apparel slash food merchants uh, before it is, you know, by somebody like a Home Depot. You know, it's interesting. We've had a lot of guests on recently, Greg, who have, some have been skeptical of advanced air mobility, but have said, for example that with drones and service delivery, especially, for example, in healthcare, you're in the healthcare, yeah, healthcare area as well. Sure. Yeah, no, I Isn't agree. that, what do you like about that? Boy, there seem to be an awful lot of opportunities. Yeah, no, I think I think all of, all of that, healthcare is another great example of pharma, right? You know, uh, that's a perfect example of something that's high value add product, but is, uh, is lightweight, you know, fairly easy to think about delivering that way. So I think experiments around all of that, you know, are great. The folks I know, and you guys are so much closer to this, so, so I'll show my uh, ignorance very quickly on this one. But there's, you know, just working around the city by city ordinances, the uh, the FAA ordinances, the airspace issues, things like that, depending on where you are, can be fairly easy or fairly difficult. So I think there's a lot of kind of what I saw back, but it's not really, you know, background infrastructure like building a road. But it's in the same way, There's you got those same constraints of just making sure you work through all the natural, to pick up a, a word that people won't like too much, just government bureaucracy around making sure you can do that in an efficient and effective manner. What's the best way for airlines to participate in this broad umbrella of advanced air mobility? Clearly, the, the EV toll use case of this very small you know, gauge air transport is the obvious way, albeit not really in the near term. But what about moving cargo with unmanned systems? You know, if you're running an airline today and somebody came to you with the idea of getting in the drone cargo market, what would your reaction be? How would you evaluate this opportunity? Yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, again, I think the airlines are kind of a natural place to think about that because they're in a lot of the cargo, not all, but a lot of the cargo that goes on uh, airplanes is fairly high value added uh, parts and, and some lightweight parts. So I'm sure there's a component there that uh, the airlines could uh, could take advantage of. I have not done that analysis, but uh, but I'd say that would be an interesting, that pharma, grocery, you know, all the areas, if you just did a two by two matrix to me and you say, what's the weight of something against what's its value, essentially? And the lighter, higher value items, I think, probably will take advantage of that first. What about supersonic flight? There have been some recent attempts at innovation on that front. Again, having your airline executive head on, how would you, how do you think about those? Supersonic, I'm not as enthused about, Luca, as, uh, as probably, you know, what can be done with drone delivery and things like that. And it's not because I don't think at some point in time, it, it might not be something people want. But when you do the calculation of how much, you know, how much time do you really save versus, you know, the expense of doing it, that curve has always been out of whack for me. Even back to, you know, when we, uh, we would all, you know, fly the Concorde occasionally, the expense of that ticket and the uncomfortableness of the plane because of the, uh, of the sort of what the fuselage has to look, had to look like just wasn't worth even across the Atlantic uh, pickup in time that you that you got. I mean, it was a novelty, but it wasn't a necessity. And I think that's the curve I would look at is uh, when can you get the cost curve for flights like that? You know, I don't know what the premium has to be, 15%, 20%. 
probably not more than that. But when can you get the, the, the cost curve down to a point where it really does make some sense? Right. Otherwise, you're paying for a business class ticket or even higher for economy comfort. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, in a in a time when you're kind of electing to go to uh, North America, to Europe or North America, to Asia, or, you know, you're flying long haul flights for a couple, two or three hours, you know, how much more are you really, really going to pay? At least for me, I may be old fashioned, but I, I don't mind having a little bit of time in the airplane where I'm disconnected from the world these days because it seems exactly. like I'm so connected everywhere else. Right. And I guess it, a lot of it depends also on what happens after you land at the destination. Do you have a connection to catch? And in that way, the entire network has to be optimized around this capability so that you don't end up arriving two or three hours earlier at the airport and waiting for that time until your next connection. It, it, ex exactly. Yeah. How much time do you really do you really save? So. So, Greg, you're about to invest in a company. You've heard there's a, a good company to invest in and you want to evaluate the business. Uh, what do you do beforehand and what do you what do you do when you go to visit the company? What are you looking for? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. So um, the first thing I do kind of when looking at the company, Jim, is what I mentioned before, which is pull out a piece of paper and uh, write market financial product people. And, and you know, so what would I do? What, what value add could could I add to this company? Right. Is this something? that it would be worth it, where I could bring something, you know, a differential to somebody else. Cause I really do concentrate on investing in those areas where I feel like I've got a, got something to offer and can, can add a little bit of value. So that's probably the first, uh, the first thing I do. And then, you know, when I get there, obviously you're digging through the financials and uh, you know, I do a little Porter's five forces analysis, you know, what are the, what's the power of the suppliers to this industry of the customers of this industry? What do the competitors look like? you know, going through uh, that, that kind of analysis. And then uh, mainly I'm, I'm really interested in the management team. You know, who are they? Uh, how well do they understand their business? How well have they thought through some of the constraints that are coming their way? Where do they see the opportunity? You know, the, uh, those are those are really probably the fundamental areas and uh, fundamental things I do. And in the size companies that you invest in, what's the biggest kind of the black hole? What's the blind spot you see in business people that is that is a common one? And one that you should you want to tell them today in this podcast and say, uh, you know, these are things to be aware of. I would say, you know, two, two things. It's a great question. One is just the ability to articulate a clear, concise strategy, you know, and and uh, direction for the company. So I really look for them to be able to have a, you know, a two minute pitch, a 20 minute pitch and a two hour pitch on their company. You know, where, where do you want to take it? What you know, what's your real uh, value add, you know, where's your competitive advantage? Just uh, basically that one page uh, that, you know, walking through some version of their version of that, that whatever one page plan they have for the business. Uh, so that's probably one. And then the second one is just really thinking about how to grow the business. You get paid such a differential multiple for growth than you do for, say, cost reduction or, you know, a, um, a GDP kind of grower in, in, in business that, uh, just really, really being thoughtful and thinking through how do I how do I grow this thing? How fast? How far? What what resources do I need financially? And maybe what resources? Even more importantly, what resources do I need on my management team to really grow the business? One of the standouts from your book that I thought was just terrific, all, right away and, and all at once, mm -hmm. was that you focus on revenue growth. You know, so often you see companies, you know, slashing costs initially, and obviously there will be some right sizing. Yeah, but you, but your team focuses on revenue growth. Yeah, I always in business say, uh, you know, focus on money in, not money out, and that doesn't mean, as you said, Jim, that you don't focus on productivity and on cost, but you cannot save your way to prosperity. You know, I used to like to say you can make a pizza so cheap nobody wants to eat it. <laughs> And, you know, but the only way you're really successful is to sit back and think about how do I optimize the revenue of the company? What do I do to create real growth here? And the growth flywheel is such a positive flywheel. If you're growing, you know, you have more opportunities for your people. If you have more opportunities for your people, their satisfaction's higher. If their satisfaction's higher, your customer satisfaction's higher. Funny thing I used to like to say is, is growth cures cancer, basically, uh, you know, it, it covers up for a lot of a lot of mistakes. And uh, so we're we're really always uh, pretty intently focused on growth. Can you unpack this a little bit more? What are some of the levers that perhaps you pulled while turning Continental around that focused around growth or maybe some other examples of other businesses that you participated? Yeah, Either no, I, 
I can give you a kind of a few examples. So um, let me just do Burger King kind of first. You know, at Burger King, when we came, just fallen below on a uh, on a revenue per unit basis, below Wendy's. We are already behind McDonald's. And so just a couple simple things, and they cut costs to the bone, essentially. And the franchisees were upset because of it all. And so we just kind of first looked at the menu and said, what do they have on the menu that we don't? And, you know, no surprise, they had what we call whole muscle chicken. So chicken tenders. We didn't have any chicken tenders. They had salads. You know, we didn't have any salads, which is often a veto vote from mom, you know, when they want to come to uh, want to come to the restaurant and so on. And we sort of said, well, let's at least first build a menu that actually gives us every opportunity to win. We then said our product isn't all that great because at lunchtime we'd use these heat shoots, if you remember seeing those things, and we make a bunch of whoppers in advance. And every time you put a whopper on the heat shoot, if it sits there for one minute, every minute it loses 10 degrees. So a whopper comes out at 160 degrees, five minutes on the heat shoot, it's 110 degrees. That's a very different product. So we got rid of the heat shoots and we put in these rolling broilers to frame broil the the patty so that we could actually make it all to order the have it your way kind of experience. And so things like that, that, you know, having the right products, having the right processes. And then we actually went really after advertising that touched our most frequent customers, uh, 18 to 27 year old male, we called them the super fan. And so we actually found a Burger King a head of a Burger King on the internet on eBay uh, they used to have these heads of Burger Kings on top of helium uh, tanks to fill up balloons for little kids. And we, we, we bought that off of eBay and we used it to create a character called the Burger King that became really kind of creepy, but also famous among that group. And it was so famous, Jay Leno would always want the Burger King to be on Jay Leno. Now, the Burger King didn't talk, but he would sit next to Leno on Leno, right? You know, uh, late night. So stuff like that. And, you know, he would run out, you know, kids would dress up as a Burger King, college kids and, uh, and run with a helmet and, or with a thing and run out. And I remember there was one Florida, Florida state game where some, some guy dressed up as the Burger King and actually stole the ball in the middle of the game. And, you know, you couldn't get publicity like that. So, you know, it was a combination of really getting the right product and the right advertising, but also operationally kind of sinking, uh, sinking things up. And that allowed us to actually grow our revenue, you know, average revenue per unit from 900,000 to about a, a million six in about two years, uh, which uh, drove the profitability up by five times. And so that's one quick example of, of that in the airline business. You know, we were 10th place airline. We were 10th out of 10 and on time, 10th out of 10 in baggage handling. That had right. 10 in customer complaints and had 10 presidents in 10 years. So, uh, <laughs> you, know, it was, uh, you know, it was a 499 on Fortune 500's company list. I can't remember the company below us. And by the time we left, we were eight, number 18 on the 100 best places to work in America. We'd won the J.D. Power Award six years in a row. But we, uh, you know, we went about cleaning up the airplanes, cleaning up the airports, putting really good food on the airline. I mean, I could take you through a story in each of these areas, but uh, we run out of time. We really, really did focus on the product and on the people. And uh, that actually allowed us to, you know, to create a situation where revenue went up. We also pulled 18% of the capacity out. We had planes. You all remember the A300s. Uh, I used to call them the A360s because they leave the gate and turn around and come back for a mechanical all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we set those airplanes down. And then we regauge the airline. So we put the uh, the seven uh, six sevens where the triple sevens were. We put the you know seven five sevens where the six sevens were. So we reduced the capacity, and uh, and the airplanes filled up. And you know we redid the interiors. A uh, lot of famous stories on this. Repainted all the airplanes. Uh, there were seven different tails on the air airline when we got there. Uh, it was the seven different mergers uh, that formed uh, Continental and. Uh, so we actually set up four different uh, lines to replace the interior, replace the interiors and repaint the airplane so that we had a consistent fleet. So what, what, what are some of the most memorable stories in turning Continental around? You know, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, one of my favorites, there's a bunch of them. So uh, one of my favorites was I was uh, we had just got done over about six months repainting all the airplanes and redoing all recovering all the seats. And everybody said that could not be done. By the way, the seats because it was seven different airlines, whenever a seat would break, they just replace it with whatever they had. So, 
you know, the seats looks like the United Nations on there or something. I mean, it's one of everything. We recovered all those. And I was on a 31 year old 737. Uh, I think it was a 200 coming from Dallas to Houston. And I was sitting next to a person who had no idea <clears throat> who I was, a customer. And he said, I can't believe how great it is that Continental's got all these new airplanes. And we were on a 31 year old <laughs> airplane. I didn't have the heart to tell him, but just the whole perception change we had in Houston, we had these, uh, we had this brown carpet in the in the terminal had not been changed in probably 20 years pea green carpet on the walls on the way into the restrooms i mean it was hideous and <laughs> so we re we changed all the carpet we repainted everything and the employee attitude went up dramatically and one of my favorite metrics to track we did a lot of other things too we won't have time to talk about here but uh one of my favorite metrics to track in terms of employee morale was the sale of company logo merchandise at the company store, you know, hats, caps, t-shirts, sweatshirts, you know, stuffed animals, you know, stuffed airplanes with Continental on them. When we got there, we would actually, people would tell us when they got home, they would take off their Continental shirt because they didn't want anybody to know that they worked at Continental. And by the time we got three or four years into doing this turnaround, we couldn't keep merchandise in stock at those company stores because the employees were so proud to be part of Continental. You go anywhere you went, any restaurant, any ball game, any play, you'd see all kinds of hats, caps, and t-shirts and sweatshirts with Continental on it because people were so proud to wear it. So those are that's kind of a fun metric to kind of track for all that. When you look at some of the emerging airframers in aviation, either working on eVTOLs or electric aircraft, uh, who also want to be the operator, but today they're very much focused on design and getting aircraft through certification. What do they have that's coming in their way that they're not completely unaware of now, you know, that might be a, a surprise as they start operating their aircraft as an airline? Yeah, it's it's really, that's a great question, Luca. It's very interesting when you, uh, when you have something conceptually and you're working so hard to get it uh, certified and, and to make it work, the models I've seen sometimes leave out a couple of different things. One is just the economics, right? So, you know, I think the one thing and they need to be just honest about is whatever economics you have in your model, have you allowed enough time for how long you have to be on the ground? Have you allowed enough time for all the fees and increases to the fees at the airport? Have you allowed enough time, uh, enough uh, cost in there for what your, uh, what your people are going to demand in terms of, uh, in terms of wages? And when you boil that all through, what price is somebody going to have to pay for your service? And does it make sense vis-a-vis -vis their other options? So I see that one being a kind of missed, uh, missed component a, a lot. And then I think the other one that I, I'll see sometimes is just you're so into the technology. Have you kind of thought about well, how the service is going to feel? How are you going to get your customers? You know, what's their experience going to be like on the way to the airport? What do you want it to be like when they get to the airport? What's the flight experience going to be like? Sometimes, you know, no surprise when you're so busy trying to get certified and things like that. Some of those pieces of the model kind of get dropped. Greg, and, and uh, right away and all at once, you talk about there are different types of your turnaround. And one is not obvious. You know, you just think of troubled businesses, but you talk about another example as well. Talk about that, but also give your five steps to a turnaround. And if you could, if you could do it with an example of a company that you've helped to turn around, that'd be great. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. So um, in terms of, you know, in terms of the two ty types of companies, one is one like we were at Continental or Burger King was when I was there, where you absolutely can see a turnaround is needed. Everybody agrees that a turnaround is needed. The company's failing. It's not successful. Those are actually the easy ones in many ways because uh, you don't have any resistance to change. I think sometimes the harder ones are what I call companies that are satisfactorily underperforming. So they're doing just enough to get by, but they're far from optimized in terms of the company. And quite frankly, they need uh, a five-step process every bit as much. And uh, it, it's actually a, a good call out. And they're harder because people often will be resistant to change. So you have to you have to be a change management master in those especially. But in terms of the five steps, so st step one is build a plan and track your progress. That's the one page plan we've talked about already here. Take out a sheet of paper, write market financial product people, write no more than four or five things on, in 14 font or big, bigger 
under each of those that you really need to do to be successful. Those are kind of called the value levers. So step one is really get a good plan at Continental. We call that the go forward plan. Fly to, uh, fly to win was our market plan, fund the future, our financial plan, make reliability a reality, our product plan and working together, our people plan. And under each of those, we had four or five things we wanted to uh, accomplish. I, I'll give you a, a, an example. So under fly to win, our market plan, uh, the first thing we wrote is stop flying places that lose money, basically. The fastest way to make money is to stop playing places that lose it and or stop you know doing things that lose it in any business. We shut down 18% of the flying that was cash flow negative, wasn't covering the cost of the food, the fuel, the crew, and the aircraft rent. That was kind of you know just an example underneath those four categories. Then fund the future is the second part of the plan. And that if you don't have some funds, you're not going to have a future. Uh, that's mainly making sure you have plenty of cash. And one of the things, Luke, at uh, what you mentioned on entrepreneurs that have ideas is uh, lots of times the idea is great, but if you run out of cash on the way to executing it, you it never sees the light of day. And that happens so often. So make sure you have plenty of cash and make sure your debt maturities actually match your assets. So don't, uh, don't shorten your life just by having uh, your debt come due too quickly. So that would be kind of the financial uh, plan. You know, an example of that, you know, when I got just to stay with the airline, uh, since that's what we're kind of talking about, when we got to Continental, I came in the first part of November and by Thanksgiving, we discovered that the company was gonna run out of cash on January uh, the 17th, which was payroll and just a, a month and a half later. The reason that we just discovered it is because they knew what the cost of the airline were, but they wanted to present a profit budget to the board. So they plugged the revenue number and I started tracking the credit card receipts. And I realized that somebody, either American Express, somebody wasn't, uh, didn't, did, wasn't sending us our money because these credit card receipts weren't coming back. So I called the uh, president of American Express at the time and I said, hey, could you send us our money? We're getting kind of short. And he said, you have all your money. And uh, that's when I discovered that they just plugged the revenue line, right? So it never made any sense. So make sure you have some funds uh, to have a future. And then uh, think money and not money out. We already talked about a little bit, but uh, it's how do you generate revenue, right? You know, and we, we went through that example with, uh, mm -hmm. with the airline there. And then step four is actually build a team, you know, a clean house if necessary. And what you need to do in any business, and we do this every year, by the way, at the Home Depot, is you need to take out your one page plan and lay it in front of you and then have a blank piece of paper next to it and say, what team do I need to execute this plan? Who do I need? I, what A players do I need to do that? And in really broken companies, you're gonna find that you need to replace up to 80% of the people in order to be able to execute your plan. And that was certainly true in Continental. Mm -hmm. We let go 50 of 61 officers uh, and treating them with dignity and respect, but then brought in 20 people who really knew what they were doing. In a really good company, like say a Home Depot or a company that's very well run, you still probably have 10 or 15% of the people every year you need to move around and shift around and make sure you got the right people in the right place to execute the plan and that you're giving them the right experience. And then the last uh, part of the plan is, I call it let the inmates run the asylum. Basically it's empower those that work for you. It's uh, once you have a plan, you've got a fortress balance sheet, you've got plenty of cash and you got your debt in the right position. Uh, you know, you've thought about how to really generate revenue. You've got the right team managing it. You actually need to empower those men and women that are really serving your customers. You know, we, we did that in a lot of different ways by uh, empowering the employees at, uh, at Continental, for example. And we put a place, a couple incentives. So every month we were first uh, uh, or sec first in on time, we, we paid them a hundred bucks a month and we paid them 65 bucks a month for second and third. So every time the customer went, won, the employee won, and they got a separate check in that month would say, thank you for helping us be on time, Gordon and Greg. And uh, their payroll taxes would come out of their normal paycheck. So they'd have spending money. They could just go and uh, spend. I had one mechanic call me and basically say, hey, Greg, do you know what $100 is to me? And I said, I have no idea. He said, it's two beers and a table dance. So uh, we didn't have to, <laughs> have to have money, but, you know, we tried to reward him for it. And then we also put in place a profit sharing plan where 15% of the profits before taxes would actually go to them. 
and we'd ride around on Valentine's Day, jumping out of Brinks trucks and handing out profit sharing checks. And it was uh, it was so <laughs> so, uh, so we put in place some incentives to kind of enforce the be the behavior we were we were hoping for. Isn't that great? I remember Mr. Bethune caught some heat after 9-11 that uh, I believe, Greg, where he continued to insist on the bonus for the on time arrival. Yeah, I'm sure. And I'm sure he probably did. I had, I'd left shortly before that, but uh, but it was such a key part of yes. the culture of the airline. It was uh, and it was absolutely the right thing to do. Incidentally, on that on time bonus that we paid the hundred bucks a month, well, we went from being last place in on time to fourth place the first month we announced it. The first place, I think, the third and fourth month we announced it, and uh, and it was uh, it was absolutely incredible, but. We were spending that that incentive, by the way, cost us about a million dollars a month. And we were spending almost four million dollars a month on uh, reaccommodating people's uh, for hotels, their bags. Right. You know, basically when we were late, we were missing connections and you know, over time for uh, employees and stuff. It was costing us four times what it was to actually pay an on time bonus just to be on time. We actually now, save money doing that. Right. Remarkable. You have a great TED talk out talking about the design of life that matters. Yeah. And and for those who many who know you, they know you're a very tough guy in business. You're an extraordinary person as well. Just talk a little bit about that TED talk and and the message you send from that for our audience, because I'd love to have them know that part of you. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Jim. The, the the TED talk was actually the five steps, and with the business steps we went through, there's corollary life steps. And so I discovered in my when I was uh, about 45 years old, by every business metric, I had been a success. You know, I you know in terms of run a bunch of companies, turned them around, done very well, articles written in a lot of places. And, and uh, but uh, I kind of felt empty inside. There's a, in the Bible uh, that Jesus talks about a church in Laodicea that's neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. That's not very good. And that's what I felt like. So I actually sat down and said, I wonder if you can write a one page plan for business, if you could write a one page plan for your life basically. And so I sat down and, and reflected and actually wrote a one page plan around faith, family, friends, fitness, and finance. Started executing my life by writing down what were my blue chips in life. Because you know, in poker, you have blue chips worth 25 bucks, red chips worth 10 bucks, and white chips worth a buck. In our lives, we tend to focus on our to-do list of those white chips. And uh, I really wanted to focus on the things that were important. And so I found that that framework, just like just like market, financial, product, and people in life, if you used faith, family, friends, fitness, and finance, and enlisted the three or four things under each category, it really helped me. And so I started sharing that with others, and they started using it. It started making a difference. And then in in life, the financial plan, the second step is called choose freedom, and that's uh, if you remember, Fortress Balance Sheet was uh, the business one, and. That's all about uh, actually running your life in a way and your balance your balance sheet and, and how much you borrow and and how you spend your money in a way that you can execute your life plan so that the bank you own the bank instead of the bank owning you and nothing stands in the way of you doing that. And then the third step was think money in how to generate revenue in business, uh, not money out. In life, it's the opposite. It's think money out, not money in. Generosity is the only cure for materialism. There's, I don't know, 15 or so major worldviews I track down in the world. Christianity, Judaism, Muslim, the Enlightenment movement with Immanuel Kant, atheism, and so on. And the only thing they all agree on is that we should give alms to the poor, that we need to take care of those less fortunate than us. So that's a key component to really living, I think, a happy and successful life. And then uh, Step four was build a team, a life team. Uh, so very similar to business. And uh, I think about that in concentric circles. So if you think about the circle closest to you that you meet with daily or very frequently, you need to make sure those people are the people that can help you execute your life plan, that give you energy, that challenge you, that, that'll hold you accountable. And if you have somebody in that inner circle that's not helping or that you're not really helping them, you don't have to lose them as a friend, just move them to an outer circle. 
that does not work with your mother-in-law, but it works pretty good with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> the, last, the last one, and I'm going fast. I apologize. I know we're on limited time, but the last one is invest in family and friends. And uh, a great book was written called The Road to Character by David Brooks, who's a New York Times columnist. And uh, oh, yeah. in there, he said, we have resume virtues and eulogy virtues. So resume virtues are what your mother, you know, what you read about in somebody's bio or I usually try and get my mother to give my introductions, but, but the eulogy virtues are, what do you want people to say at your funeral? Right. And so it's, how do you invest in people to, to do that? One of the best examples I have of that, which is worth people hearing is uh, Frank Blake, who was the CEO, chairman and CEO of Home Depot. I call him on Sundays and he'd actually be in his office and he wrote around 200 thank you notes every Sunday to somebody that had done something extraordinary, whether it be an associate at Home Depot or a banker who had helped him, you know, do something. And uh, I think if we all were to admit it, we all have drawers full or at least email boxes full of gratitude notes that people have sent us, the thank you notes, or, you know, this has been great that you did this. And the reason we keep those is they're, they're so rare, right? So Frank would do 200 of those uh, a week. And it changed so many people's lives, just his willingness to sit down and say, hey, I really appreciated what you did. Thank you for doing that. Just a very, very powerful thing to do. So those are the those are the corollary five steps. And uh, if you want, uh, I think you can Google the podcast. And it only takes oh, 10 yeah. minutes. You can watch it. Thanks, Thanks for sharing that, Greg. Yeah. If you fast forward five, 10 years, what does the aviation industry look like? That's a great question. I think to, on the commercial airline side, it'll be improved, but pretty much the same. You know, I think that model will be there, you know, for a while. I think there'll be an increasing pressure on general aviation, you know, on, uh, you know, having your own airplane or being able to charter an airplane. I think that for longer haul stuff will be the same. And then what I'm hoping, and you guys are closer to this than I am, but I'm hoping this whole air mobility opportunity with both drones and with passenger travel, electric planes and things like that will proceed swiftly and uh, and will really make a difference. I don't have a good sense of how long that's going to take to get through whatever it ta you think it's going to take to get through the process of certification. You can pretty much double it. And that's probably the right answer. If you were the CEO of an airline right now, would you invest in let's say vertical takeoff aircraft? I'd have a, a, a venture fund that could, uh, we had a venture fund at Continental where we could actually invest in things like uh, at the time we, uh, we did uh, orbits, right? You know, I mean, oh, yeah. uh, you know, we had a bunch of little ventures going on, some of which paid off big and some of which, um, you know, didn't, which is the nature of a venture fund. But I absolutely would have some bets if I was an airline, not big bets, but small bets in vertical technology. What advice would you give to someone who wants to start a business in aviation or advanced air mobility? I would say start with a large fortune and expect to end up with a small one. Um, it's, uh, it's actually, it takes a lot of time. Aviation is a business because of the way it's regulated and because of the barriers to entry, it just takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and more time and money than you would expect till you get to the other side. I don't think that should be discouraging, but you you ought to be kind of honest about it. And a really great way to do to take a look at it would be to look at you know ten or fifteen startups in aviation that are similar to what you're trying to do, hmm. and go interview those folks because and ask them kind of you know what were the things you really did right and what were the things that were the the roadblocks kind of what budget did you start with what budget did you end up with in terms of what it cost both co both money and time to get it done. And uh, I think it would be enlightening. <laughs> I would bet people say it took a lot longer and cost a lot more than I thought. Yeah, I think that's pretty much true across the board in any industry <laughs> in the startup world. So Greg, we've talked about a lot, but if you wanted to summarize the podcast or leave one message with our audience, what would it be? I think my message would be uh, focus as much on life as you do on work. If you kind of followed the five steps that we talked about, I think you'll bring a lot more value to you, yourself, to your company, to your family, if you actually focus on the people that you're working with and the, and the people that are close to you. We all only get one shot at this thing and uh, called life. And I think none of us will remember the last meeting, you know, the millions of meetings we were in or the millions of conversations we have, you know, we will remember the people in our lives that made a difference, right? That really invested in us. And I just say, uh, 
invest in others, especially invest in your employees. Luca, anything else from you? No, this was a, this was really, really great discussion, Greg. Thank you very much. And lots of words to live by peppered throughout our conversation. So I appreciate that as well. I, I'm probably the least enlightened airline guy now because I've been gone. <laughs> so long, but but uh, it was fun talking to you guys. You're a remarkable guy, Greg. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. All right. That's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss. And goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned. And all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty, or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general, educational, and entertainment purposes only.